So what's up? Uh, my name is Misha, and I thought I'd make a tutorial on how I used RPG Maker MV and turned it from the default assets and imported my watercolor drawings into MV using parallax mapping. I used Echo 607's YouTube tutorial mostly for parallax mapping, but I'll show my particular process and how I got it going for Shivering Hearts. So for thumbnail sketches, I only did thumbnail sketches for like just the area in the demo. But it's definitely something I want to do a lot more. By doing like a series of small five minute sketches, it really helps me lay the foundations of the map and to convey a particular mood without having to commit fully into like one drawing. Next, I'd mock up an initial layout using the default RPG Maker tile set. This is mostly to get an idea for scale in relation to the player character and how you can like walk through the space. It's nice to get landmarks to use as anchor points for the drawing. Walking through the space is, is nice as well, but as long as it functions and the space doesn't feel like too big or too small, you can't really go wrong at this point. Next, right click the map you want to change and then press save as image. This is a new feature for MV. Save it to a directory. Uh, I usually place all of mine in its own directory on my D drive, but this time I'm just going to place it on my desktop. It creates a PNG file, but it exports it like half the resolution of what it actually is. Each square on the grid is 48 by 48 pixels. So this village map, for example, the original size is 1920 pixels by 960, but it exports at 960 width by 480. This might be a bit of a problem if you're taking this image and then you're photoshopping it like how other tutorials do it. But since all I'm doing it is using it as a reference, I just use Photoshop to size it to an A3 piece of paper, and I don't really worry about the blurriness or whatever. Just size it to whatever paper you're going to use. You can use whatever drawing style or mode of representation from here. Charcoal, oil painting, collage, tablet drawing. I really like Hades or I guess any visual novel that uses tablet drawing for its art style. For me, I feel like mechanical pencil, like traditional pencil drawing and watercoloring is my strength. And I enjoy it a lot, so I've been using this method. You can skip here if you just care about more of the technical side of things and don't really care about my drawing techniques, but I'm going to expand a bit on my drawing style. So I would export that rough layout as a PNG file, which I then print off onto paper at a local print shop. I use black and white to keep the printing costs down. What do I use to paint? So I've been painting and drawing since, since I was quite young, like 13 years old. Not like uh, super consistently every single year of my life, but it's been a big chunk of my life. I honestly feel like brands don't matter too much in like all parts of life, but drawing especially, you don't, I don't think brands matter that much. But I guess for documentation, I used this Pentel Smash 0.5mm mechanical pencil for like 95% of my drawings. I bought this mostly because of this Kingdom Hearts drawing by Tetsuya Nomura. I'm just a big fanboy, but I really like the weight of the pencil. It honestly doesn't really matter. It's, it's like the same exact pencil lid as any other mechanical pencil. In fact, like, I, I lost that pencil, so I'll see if I can bother to get a new one, but these older pencils will do perfectly for now. I use this watercolor paper. I think it's a New Zealand brand. Again, doesn't matter. Uh, I think having an adequate thickness to your watercolor paper is very important. I think going underneath 100 GSM makes the paper a bit too weak, because if you're working with paper that's too weak, and you just have, like, pools of water when you're painting with watercolor, it starts, like, bending and buckling the paper and making it really hard to work with. So having a nice thick paper thickness is quite important. So for the watercolors, um, I use this, like these really old paints that were passed down to me from a relative. I think these paints are actually like as old as me, like 27 years old. It's quite buzzy to think about how long watercolor paints last for compared to like acrylic paints. So once that's printed, I then take a lamp and then I project light through my glass desk to use as a makeshift light table. Uh, real light tables are pretty expensive, for me anyway. They're like over $100 for a decent sized one. So I just use this method. And then I would draw and then paint on watercolor paper to add uh, qualitative elements like the, you know, blemishes and tone, working up the tone and conveying depth in the painting. Color, having a nice array of different colors, uh, light, shadow, environmental details, you know, all, all that stuff, all that stuff. A lot of this is imaginative, but here's some reference images I googled to draw the visuals from. I think drawing without some real life reference images on hand, it can make for boring results. If you're just using your imagination, I don't know about you guys, but 
I find that I'm not actually that creative. I'm joking, I'm joking, but it's mostly because I don't know how certain things might work. Like, how does grass in perspective look? You know, you have individual blades of grass overlapping or foreshortening into the foreground. You know, some blades of grass are like a bit thicker than others and they taper off and do all these weird angles. Or tree branches, like that's a big one. I, I felt like, you know, you don't really think about how weirdly shaped tree branches are until you really look at them and they're like, oh, okay, so it kind of branches off here. Maybe they, they, they curve in this direction or one foreshortens in this way. One has like little twigs, one's like really thick. You know, it's, it's a lot of little details like that that I feel like adds a lot of believability to the drawing. You know, I'm no, I'm no Bob Ross. I, I can't, I don't have like, like thousands and thousands of uh, landscape images absorbed into my brain so I can just whip one out on the fly. But you don't want to paint and replicate exactly what you see in the reference. Just use them as what they are, as references. And you use these, the anchor points that you sent yourself in RPG Maker and then you kind of like spin it in your mind. And when you put it onto the page, it becomes its own unique thing. Uh, experience at color theory and lighting, tone, mark making, uh, it goes a long way. I'd say that's way more important than brands of art supplies. So here's an example. Um, during the main village of Shivering Hearts, uh, took about eight to nine hours using a mechanical pencil. There's so many like different strokes and different dirt lines and pathways and blades of grass that I really, really try to put as much detail into. And then from that, uh, it was another 20 or so hours of watercoloring. And watercoloring takes a while because of the drying process. Also because I made the initial line work with a mechanical pencil, like super intricate. This became like a double-edged sword of sorts. So it gave me a lot to, uh, it gave me a lot to work with, but it also gave me a lot of work to do. And that's why it took such a long time. Also because with watercolor, I like to work in layers and because if you have different colors of watercolor really close and they still haven't dried properly, the colors start to merge together. When you have that, it looks a bit sloppy, I think. So you kind of want to wait until it's fully dried. Put the drawing aside, don't even touch it. Watch, watch a YouTube video or do another drawing. And then once that's fully dried, bring it back in and start layering more and more pigments on top of it. Which I think looks way more crisp than trying to be too rash about it and just paint whatever. With watercolor, you can't really make mistakes easily. Like you can't really erase mistakes. You really have to plan out how you're going to approach the painting and at what order you want to paint it. Like, okay, first I'm going to do the ground layer. Then I'm going to work up these tree tops. And then once that's dried, I will paint the trees underneath the building here. So really there's a lot of planning involved. Once the drawing is done, I then scan it back into the computer. The paper I have is about A3 size, but my scanner at home is only A4, so I had a bit of trouble. I scan it as a PNG file at about 300 dpi, which is high enough. I don't think you need to go any higher than that. Then in Photoshop, I'll stitch the scans together into a seamless landscape. Maybe I will have to invest in an A3 scanner sometimes so I can remove this step and have it a lot more consistent, but for now, uh, I kind of like stitching these drawings together. I then go back to the original exported drawing here and then I double the size on Photoshop. Then you just put the drawing onto that original drawing and then you set the opacity down and then you match the drawings together to make it as seamless as possible. A lot of detail has been lost in this process because of the resolution I'm working at but I think it still looks decent enough. This takes a lot of experimenting and how you can fit it really well into RPG Maker. Be patient on yourself if it doesn't really work out the first try. So you place the PNG file into the parallax folder in your game files. Right click the map properties, go to edit, and then click parallax. And then you select the parallax. Make sure that show in editor is clicked. Take a transparent tile and apply it to the whole map to show the parallax underneath. Now you can walk through it as a parallax. But we're not done yet. You definitely need an overlay layer. You don't want people to like start walking on the roofs and stuff. So go back into Photoshop and then you start cropping the foreground elements from the background. This can be like a really long process. I think this picture in particular took about four hours, especially with tweaking things and experimenting. I was kind of eyeballing it, but I have the tops of the trees and the buildings as part of the overlay layer and up to a certain height, about two squares worth or like the height of the characters, that would remain as the background. 
So it might look like I got it in one go, but trust me, there was a lot of experimenting and hours of work that I just cut out because this process is very bespoke. You have to make sure things don't look too awkward. There's always more that you can keep tweaking on. Once that's done, go back into Photoshop and then hide the background layer to make the checkered box in the background come up. This indicates that you're working on a transparent layer. Save this image as a PNG file and name it as the foreground element. Place both the foreground and the background images in the pictures folder. This is separate to the parallax folder. Next, we have to work out the collisions. So if open up an A tile set in Photoshop, for example, I'll use this dungeon underscore a1.png. Fill the first 3x6 grid with a black rectangle with like 50% opacity, and then do the same with white on this 3x6 grid here. Make the rest of the tile set invisible, and then save the new tile set into the tile set folder. I'll link my version of the tile set in the description if you want to skip this step. Open up RPG Maker. The next step is for our reference, not in the final exported game. Create an event on say like the top left of the map, and set the trigger as parallel. Now for a few commands, create an event command, then click show picture on page two. Set this as the lower picture. Next, do a plugin command that will be on page three. Write this down, bind picture to map space one. The next plugin command you do is change picture layer space one space below characters, then create another show picture and then set this as the overlay picture. Very important, make the picture number two. Then make another plugin command and type in bind picture to map space two. Lastly, create an erase event. Now it's good to have the parallax show in the editor so you know where to set up collisions and all that game logic. But when you're actually in the game, you don't really need RPG Maker to render the parallax because you're using bind to pictures plugin to render everything from the pictures folder. So rendering the parallax in game is just unnecessary slowdown. I'd say make your parallax empty in the final exported game like this. Next we have to set up the collisions. Go to database and create a new tile set with your black and white PNG. Make the black squares an X so you can't pass through them along with the transparent tile underneath it and make sure the white parts are a circle. In map properties, change the maps tile set to the one we just made. With the black, mark the areas where the player can't walk over and mark with white where the player can walk over. When all of that's done, click the transparent tile underneath the black tile for instance, then click the fill button and then fill all the black areas with the transparent version. Do the same for the white areas where you can pass through. Then make your player location somewhere on the map. You just right click and then do set player location. Then just run your game to test it. And here you go, a nice looking watercolor map in RPG Maker. So that's about the main gist of how I imported my watercolor drawings into RPG Maker, but I feel like I want to take this time to analyze it and see where I could improve from here. So one thing I feel is that I could have developed the initial concept stage and the base layer here. This could have been a lot more interesting and a lot more complex. I felt like this was because it was my first time doing things. I was quite cautious. I really conformed really heavily to RPG Maker's 48 by 48 pixel grid. The thing about this process is that while you're creating, you know, a really beautiful looking map, it's still just one map. And I think there's real value in working in tile sets and how cost effective and time efficient it is. Like how, you know, Sweet Corden or the older Final Fantasies work. But then there are things that you can't pull off as easily with tile sets. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but having things go off the grid or having like really unique details that only show up in one part of the map, it's a lot harder to accomplish that if you're using tile sets. So despite some disadvantages, especially time efficiency, I still really, really like this way of working and how to represent like a game area. And yeah, I really liked how it turned out. There's definitely room for improvement, but I honestly wasn't even sure if I was able to create Shivering Hearts in the first place. There were multiple times where I was considering cancelling it or getting frustrated and feeling like I was banging my head against the wall. But it all started with me experimenting with MV while working a full-time job and now here I'm like, oh holy crap, this is pretty, this is looking pretty nice. I was really surprised. 
I'm currently updating all the art assets in my game to work at a high definition 920 by 1080 p uh, it looks so much better, it looks really really good, especially with how I reworked a lot of areas with ink pen to really bring out a lot of hidden details. This is using Yanfly's core engine plugin. The reason why I didn't start with this resolution at first was that I felt like I was just learning the project and I didn't know how to get the HUD to scale nicely to that resolution or to import my drawings at a high enough quality without it causing memory leaks and having the drawings not even load properly. I'm starting to get the hang of all of this now though. So with parallax mapping, it also allows me to be free of RPG Maker's 48 by 48 grid in terms of collision detection and character movement, and which it's a huge deal for me. The reason why everything conforms so heavily to the grid, like the building sticking to these right angles, is because I was, like again, I was sticking to the 48 by 48 grid because of all the game logic and eventing and the character movement were based on this grid. But with this new method, I can potentially create way crazier environments that go off the grid without having to worry about whether this particular door lines up to this exact point of the map. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. I, I really, I really want to see how this turns out. This method uses a couple of plugins made by an incredible plugin developer called Qshus. Once I'm done and exported a new build of Shivering Hearts, I'll make a video explaining this process as well. I'm still kind of figuring things out. The plugins are QMove and Q Collision Map Plus. So another point is optimization. TDDP Bind to Pictures. It's it's a awesome, awesome, awesome. It's such a great plugin, and I think if you're complaining about free shit that's been put on the internet by unpaid developers uh, working from their free time, you know you gotta you gotta have some perspective. <laughs> so I'm not really saying this in a mean way, but. It's reported that the script can cause memory leaks. I don't know MV's code to state why. My theory is that it's the nature of MV as a software itself rather than the plugin. I have a hefty gaming PC, so it's a bit hard for me to gauge, but as a developer, it's always good to optimize your game as much as possible for your players. There's a script made by Qshus, which seems to help with optimization and image popping with my drawings, although I need to get feedback from other people if it actually helps. Um, there's also a plugin by Galve, which loads pictures onto your RAM before it's needed, but I still need to test this out. Apparently it also fixes issues like the delay when loading in images or having images not load at all. So once I've created all the new assets for MV and imported correctly, once once that all that's done, I want to take the city drawing that I have that I did for the first iteration of Shivering Hearts, and then I want to see how I can work this up as a pencil drawing and as a watercolor painting, and then I'll fully document this process because I think that start going from start to finish is very good to kind of note my thought processes, etc. I feel that's quite a thorough description of my work process. I find that doing this helps me eliminate as much room for error when drawing environments, especially when trying to keep to scale and to make sure that everything in RPG Maker works when I import the drawing in. It takes a very long time, both in terms of physical labor and mental effort. My biggest tip for anyone who wants to do this is that don't get frustrated if it doesn't work out the first time or even the fifth time with having parts of the map overlap unintentionally or in the Photoshop layering process or having in your collisions not working properly. So you have to keep tweaking things. The greatest illusion I think you can give your players is for them to think that it's as seamless as possible and there's no problems whatsoever. The actual scripting to get the drawings into RPG Maker isn't very complex at all. You just kind of copy and paste the exact scripts that I used. It's mostly the Photoshop work and the actual drawing process that takes a lot more work to get right, especially getting the overlay layer working. So that's me guys. I hit the like and subscribe if you liked the video, it would mean a lot. And cheers. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.